Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cambridge Union. Uh, today, we're hosting Dan Meridor, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, Meridor has held numerous positions in the Israeli government, including Minister of Justice and Minister of Finance. Today, we'll be discussing his career, his thoughts on the future of the State of Israel and the Middle East, and his hopes for peace in the region. I'm aware that there's been a lot of criticism of our hosting of this event here this evening. There are people who believe, we can hear them outside, that Mr. Meridor shouldn't have been invited to speak here this evening. Um, there are people that believe that he shouldn't be allowed to speak um, because of the acts of governments of which he was a member. Um, there's been an open letter about this evening, and I'm, I'm sure you've all seen it. Many of you might have even signed the letter. Um, I want to reiterate that we at the Cambridge Union are strongly committed to our founding principle of free speech. We exist to create a, a safe space in which you, our members, can come and discuss difficult topics and have the opportunity, opportunity to cross-examine speakers like Mr. Meridor here this evening. Dan will be taking your questions here today, and if any of you have any concerns, some of which were expressed in that open letter, we would strongly encourage you to voice them in the Q&A portion at the end. Mr. Murdoch, thank you very much for coming to speak to us here this evening. Um, I'd just like to open by giving you a chance to address that open letter which was signed by numerous student organisations here at the University of Cambridge and beyond. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you'd like to voice, I, I showed it to you just before the event, um, if you have any opinions and perspectives on that. Well, good evening, everybody here. I, I start in a not a polite way, but I don't agree with you. I think that if what was written in this uh, letter is true, you shouldn't have invited me. And people who commit these things should not be invited here. Only it's all lies, simply untrue. So I'm for free speech. Sorry? You can hear me. You might not have understood me. I just said the opposite. If it's true that uh, these things, war crimes, have been committed by any person, and you know that it's true, you shouldn't invite him. He should be ostracized. Only the letter is full of lies. It's simply untrue. I don't want to relate to it because it will give too much uh, importance to uh, a paper that is based on, uh, let me say, to be nice, uh, ignorance, not to think of other motives. Uh, especially in the day that uh, Palestinians have again murdered uh, somebody in Jerusalem, putting, planting a bomb in a bus station, a 16 year olds student was killed. This is the time to speak of war crimes. Okay. Let me go to what I wanted to say, and uh, I'll open it up, of course, for questions from David, from you. When I, uh, I want to give a brief uh, overview in a broader perspective of where Israel is, and uh, in terms of outside Israel, Israel and the Arabs, and inside is uh, what happens in Israeli society. I'll do it as brief as I can, at the expense of being uh, uh, deeper, which I should have done. And then we'll go ahead from there. And I'll end up uh, in the election we just had, and the government is going to be, to be formed probably in several days. I have to say, I don't speak for the government. I don't like the government as maybe uh, established now, but it's a democratically elected government, so uh, uh, I'll say something about that as well. If you take a broad perspective, uh, one can say Israel is a success story in that uh, we started in 1948 when we got, forgive me, the British out, and we had our independence. Uh, we were 600,000 Jews uh, fighting against the huge number of Arabs after we have accepted the idea of building two states that was proposed by the UN and the Arabs rejected it and uh, this was a tough war. It ended with us surviving but it uh, did not change the Arab attitude and they thought maybe logically that if you see the asymmetry between this tiny spot called Israel and the Arab world stretching from Morocco in the Atlantic Ocean to Iraq, all Arab, hundreds of millions in such land and so forth. In the end, they will win if they continue to not accept us and they boycotted us for years. 
Uh, the word Israel was not mentioned, no commerce, nothing with Israel, and terror, and, and the wars, and so forth. Something happened in between that changed this course of history in a very positive way. I think the turning point was 1967, Six Days War, when Israel was, as the world thought, on the verge of collapsing because the Arabs wanted it to disappear, and they gathered the forces around us. And all of Europe, by the way, was, I still remember the soldier I was there those days, was demonstrating to allow the Jews to have a state, don't do again what happened earlier. And we won it in a very uh, impressive way. And I think then the understanding came to many Arab leaders that there's no way we will uh, not be there. And not that they agreed with us, but some of them understood that, uh, if put it simply, if you can't beat them, join them. Let's see if we can live together. The big breakthrough came in 1977 when the most important Arab country, Egypt, and its leader, Anwar Sadat, decided that he is going to make peace with Israel and our Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and they negotiated peace treaty and we were able to take outside this wall of animosity and belligerency around us, the main brick, Egypt. Uh, it, this, this really changed history. After this, uh, there was an attempt to speak with Syria in 91. didn't work out well. There was the Oslo Agreement in 93 with the PLO that was in the same direction, though it didn't succeed in the end. There was Jordan Israel signing a full treaty in 94. And now the longest border of Israel, Jordan and, and Israel, is, was peaceful, was very peaceful and with a border with the strongest Arab country was made peaceful. And along the years from then, I jump quickly on milestones here. We got to the Abraham Accords two years ago, where more Arab countries formalized relationship with us. They didn't have war with us, but they were part of the Arab boycott, and they changed it, and we have good relationship. I, last week, I spent uh, three days in Abu Dhabi, in the Emirates, uh, Arab, small Arab countries, and other people from the world, and without boasting, we were received very, very warmly, very well uh, in this crowd. And I think it's a very positive process. Uh, it's not easy. It's, uh, it's sometimes nerve-breaking. It doesn't go the way we always want. But basically, you see a historic change. Uh, they didn't want us, and they understood the need to live with us, and they benefit from it. And I think this spreads uh, to most of the Arab world. It's a good thing. Two problems remain that I touched them briefly here. One, Iran, that uh, is threatening stability in the region, and it created the change of the, of the, uh, of the uh, divide in the region. It's not the Jews against the Arabs. It's Israel and most of the Arabs against Iran. And the coalition that was built to stop Iran from getting nuclear by Saudi Arabia and Egypt and most Arab countries, almost all of them, and the West, America, Britain, France, the European Union, was quite effective in blocking the way or at least uh, making it difficult for the Iranians to proceed in the nuclear ambitions. It's not over. You see what happens now. But uh, Iran stays a problem from our perspective, not only because they want to uh, become, to have nuclear weapons, other countries have nuclear weapons. This country has nuclear weapons. Nobody is afraid of it. But because they say openly, which is not said by any Arab anymore, Israel should not exist. Not a question of borders of Palestinians. Israel should not exist. And they plant this uh, uh, argument in religious roots. Our religion does not allow for a non-Muslim state to be there. And you know, when you introduce uh, God Almighty to the dispute, it's very hard to solve it. If we have differences, we can compromise, half and half, 50, uh, 60, 40. If it's God's word, there's no compromise. And the introduction of religion to the conflict made it much more difficult. And religion became unfortunately important. You saw this Shia Sunnah fight in, within the Muslim world, how many hundreds of thousands of people were killed because of their identity religiously, which is very strange, but it happened. So this is another element, not only uh, delegitimizing the very existence of Israel, basing it on religious uh, belief and commandment, nuclear uh, capability, and how I put it, not playing by the rules with all sorts of proxies, 
in Yemen, they fight in Yemen, in Iraq, and they control Syria, they have Hezbollah in Lebanon, and they disrupt the stability of most Arab regimes. So we found in New Middle East where there is a natural coalition between us and them against Iran. It's not over. I leave it that. We'll come to it later if you like. The other question is not resolved, and it's a tough one, although not many people understand how tough it is, the Palestinian issue. It's not resolved. I don't agree with the present government, and I'm, this is why I'm now in Cambridge, not in the cabinet, and this is fine. But uh, there were, this government may not be very enthusiastic about having an agreement, but we had other governments. The most dovish of all, uh, by Barack uh, in 2000, I was with him, with Kim David, Maryland, United States, with Arafat, still alive, the leader of the Palestinians, with President Clinton for two weeks, uh, incarcerated at Kim David, not being able to leave, but speaking very intimately. And what was proposed there was the, fast, the, the far reaching of all Israeli proposal. And Arafat didn't want to accept it. And Clinton said, you are to blame. Why don't you want to have a state and finish the conflict? And then there was, uh, in 2008, a government by Olmert who offered this and even more uh, to Abu Mazen. And then there was, again, no reply. So I'm not blaming Israel for not for the, the, being the stumbling block. But the fact that it's not resolved is a bad thing. It's 50, it's 75 years that Israel exists. It's 55 years from the Six Days War. And we have an anomaly there. In Israel, it's normal. You have 80% uh, Jews, 20% Arabs, all equal citizens. They all vote. They are part of us in the Knesset, wherever. In the land there of Judea and Samaria, Gaza, it's a different story. Gaza was given away by us voluntarily with no agreement to the Palestinians. We quit Gaza, 2005, 2006. We forced 8,000 Jews who lived there to leave. The only place on earth the Jews cannot leave was Gaza. We took them out because we were afraid to leave them there. We said to Palestinians, the Prime Minister Dan Sharon, if you want to have sovereignty for the first time in history, there's going to be Palestinian land controlled by you. Uh, the minute we left, they killed the PLO people there, the Hamas people killed the PLO people there, and made it a launching pad of rockets. Didn't work very well. In Judea, so it's, it's one story. The other story is the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria, where there are about two million people, two and a half million people. And it's not clear what's going to happen with them. Is it going to be a state? We didn't succeed to get a state there with an agreement. Is it going to be something else? This is left unresolved and needs to be resolved. I want to move now to the second part of my introduction within Israeli society. You see, it's a, a question of uh, the nature of the society. We are part of a huge project, the Zionist project. The Jews, 85% of whom lived in Europe for practically 2,000 years since the exile by the Romans in the first century, began to feel in the wake of the 19th century that Europe is trouble. The earth was, was shaking, pogroms in Russia, the Dreyfus uh, trial in, in Paris, in, in France, accusing wrongly a Jew for spying, and uh, the feeling that it's not going to be good here. Antisemitism rising. So millions of Jews left Europe to America, two or three million in the wake in the turn of centuries. Several hundred thousand went to Western Europe, including to, to these islands. Uh, the Zionists had a different idea. We can't continue being in other countries. Let's go back to our homeland and save the Jews. They will have where to go. And we failed. We failed because the state was established in 48, not in 38. Had we had the state in 38, there wouldn't have been a Holocaust. People had where to go. But the country was under British mandate. The British, unfortunately, against their promise and commitment, uh, blocked all the escape routes from Europe to Palestine. And Jews were left to die, and they died, six million of them in, in Europe. So in that sense, we didn't succeed. But from that minute on, from, as I told you, 600,000, we got over 7 million Jews, and about 2 million Arabs, more or less the numbers. Uh, from the weakest point of weakness in our history. 80 years ago, we are maybe now in the strongest point, not only militarily, economically, scientifically, education, so forth, trying to do all this with democracy. Now, it's easy to speak of democracy 
in regular times. When Britain had the war in 1940 to 45, they detained as alien uh, uh, citizens all the Jews who were here. Because they were alien, because they had German passports, they ran away from Germany. Not very democratic. The same thing with the Japanese were treated in America. So democracy is easy when there's peace. There's war, it's not easy. And what do you do with a stranger and so forth? We tried to build a state after a bloody war in 48 and democracy. And the national Jewish cause was very important. It's rebuilding a state, of course, for the Jewish people, but doing it in democratic uh, uh, conditions by majority, minority, human rights. What complicates it more is that the, the first prime minister, mistakenly, a huge mistake, I think, followed the British example and didn't want to have a constitution. So the basic rights are not written in any document that is binding. So it was the Supreme Court of Israel that was very courageous in the early days, and they forced the government to follow the basic elements of equality, of freedom of speech, and so forth. I don't want to go into all the details, but we were able to keep, even in tough times, high standard democracy and liberal values alongside the Jewish national cause. And the build this equilibrium was, I think, this, the reason for our success. In recent years, there's a change, and it's not for the better. I'd, I'd say three things what ha that happened here, and I am concerned is a nicer word than, than other words I could use. And Mr. Miller, if we could I'll finish it. Yeah, yeah, I'll finish this, and then you ask me your questions. The world is uh, changing the course that has been set since 1945. After the Second World War, because of the horrors of that war, not only to Jews, Britain had its share and the world saw the horrors of dictatorships and uh, absolute sovereignty and the majority does what they like. And there was a beginning of a new trend against this for democracy, human rights, rule of law. Sovereignty is not above all, there's something above the state. The criminals of Germany were hanged in Nuremberg for crimes they never committed, because the German law didn't make it a crime to kill Jews. But people, the world said to them, there's something above the state. The state not everything. And they were hanged for this. And the idea of international law, protecting uh, civilians, protecting human beings against the majority sometimes, became a very important norm. Democracy was spreading in many parts of the world until Mr. Fukuyama thought we reached the end of history. The liberals won. Now there is a, a backlash. Look not only at Putin, look at Hungary, look at uh, Poland, look at France with 42% to Marine Le Pen, the extreme fascist, racist uh, party. Uh, look at Italy, a prime minister that supported Mussolini, that admired Mussolini become prime minister. And in my country as well, there is a trend or a, an attempt to, less, to give less respect to the basic ideas of human rights and equality and more to the nation. You know, a person who used to say America first, by nation above everything else, not the people, the nation, the state. The right balance between states that are important, the nations and the individual is under attack. And the legal system that protects them. This election in Israel ended up with the people who want to change the system uh, with those tiny but valid majority. And we will see what happens to the Israeli society in the coming weeks or months. And uh, let's see if my concerns have been exaggerated or not. Let me stop here. Now it's yours. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Meridor, for those, um, those opening remarks and for sharing with us the sort of the lens through which you view um, Israeli history, the history of the Middle East, and, and where we are now. Um, I'd like to now focus in a bit more on your own um, personal life, beginning, if I may, with your, with your childhood, uh, growing up, as you said, in, in Mandate era. Um, what was life like for you and your, and your family back in those days? Uh, what was the atmosphere like back then? I, uh, like many people here, I was born under British rule in Palestine. I still have a certificate of birth. But government of Palestine, district of Jerusalem, and some British officers said they had the certificate that I was born there. My, my, my late father was one of the uh, commanders of the underground that fought the British to try to open the gates and let us build our state. 
was a tough fight. My father was detained by the British, I think, for two or three years. In, in, he was a lawyer and a highly civil person, but he was a member. They, they, by the way, never, never accused him because they never could prove what was right, that he was a member of the underground. But they had the feeling and they held him under administrative detention for, for years in five or six prisons in Israel, and about two years, a year and a half in Africa in another British colony in uh, Eritrea, in, in Sudan, Asmara, in, in Cairo. Uh, so we, uh, I, I began my life. My, my mother, who was turning 100 years old in some months, uh, not very well now, was a professor of classics in the Hebrew University. She, too, was a member of the underground. So I, my early life was in the feeling that I'm not just a, a person, a citizen in a state like everybody, but that I'm a partner or a, a yeah, the partner in the project. We are part of a project, the, the project to rebuild a Jewish state, to develop a Jewish, the Hebrew language. To the, you always thought, is it? Are we doing better or worse? It's not just living somewhere. It's it's a project in in in, in the process. Uh, I went to school like everybody else, and then I went to the army, uh, and I served there as a tank commander. I wanted to become a pilot, and after two months, I understood that I'm not the right person for that, and they told me, thank you. So I went to the Armored Corps, and I was a, a tank uh, gunner, then a tank commander, then officer in tanks in the Israeli Armed Corps. I am so archaic that I fought in the Six Days War in Egypt. A successful war, successful with a heavy price. My company commander was killed just near me. But we won this war, and then I was in reserve service, and in 73, in the Yom Kippur War, I fought in the Golan Heights. The Syrians even were able to wound me, but I'm here, so it wasn't that bad. Um, I went to the Faculty of Law in Jerusalem, and I studied law, and I practiced law. And since I was uh, out of the army at the age of 20, 21, I joined the political party called Herut Mish Liberty, which was built on the on the uh, tradition of the the underground movement of which my father was one of the leaders. So I, I can say I chose it. I did choose it, but it was in the spirit of family. I was not a, a rebel against tradition. It's not nice to say, but this is the truth. And I was there. It was not my, my work. I was working as a lawyer, and I loved it very much in the courts in, in Jerusalem. By the way, most of the law then was still British or English law. We changed it little by little because the British left a system that was not like for British people, but for the natives. It was good enough. And uh, so I joined the party. I was uh, active in the party in the afternoon, the evening. I uh, don't want to go into all of this, but in 1981, the end of 81, the Prime Minister then, Mr. Begin, asked me to join, to be his secretary of his cabinet, which was uh, a surprise, surprise. I didn't know it was going to happen. It was even published in the press before I knew it, and then I found that I'm there. And uh, my life changed in that sense, and I was secretary of the cabinet of Begin. Uh, it was the last phase of withdrawal from Sinai, which was tough, but Begin went all through with it. Then the war in Lebanon that was started as a, an operation and tragically became, became a tragedy in the end. Uh, then I stayed on with the new prime minister, Shamir, and then I ran for the Knesset, for the parliament, and from 84, for many years, I was a member of the parliament, dealing with defense issues, with legal issues, constitutional issues, economy, and other things. And I served as minister of justice from 88 to 92, and I was proud that in my time, the human rights basic laws were enacted. Some of them are threatened now. And deciding not only the values, not all of them, by the way, it was tough to get all of them, but basic values are there human dignity, liberty, and so forth, uh, and that the Supreme Court has a, an over, overview or a right to judicial review on tested laws, which doesn't exist in England, but we thought it's important that majority, the democracy is not about majority. Of course, majority, not a king or not a, a dictator, but majority enough is not good enough because majority, uh, most dictators are majority. Democracy is what majority cannot do to the minority or to the, to the individual. They can't tell me you won't vote because you are black or white. You can't uh, speak because you're against the government. There are things that majority should not do in the democracy. And the courts have the function of guaranteeing that even the majority, whether it's government or parliament, 
wants to do that. So we strengthened the courts. Now it's, there's, there is, I have to say, an attempt to regress, to go back on it. And it's, to me, I don't like it. I think, I think it's fair to yeah. say that you've had um, quite a long and varied um, political career. Um, but if I may just sort of go back to sort of look at um, your time spent um, just immediately after your student days in the IDF, how do you think that sort of coloured um, your political career and what sort of perspective do you feel that that, that gave you? The objectives and the ideals... That Being in the were, army. The objectives and the ideals you felt you were fighting for in the IDF, how do you, how do you think they've shaped you to this day? I made a huge mistake, like most Israelis, after the service in the army, in the regular service, the two and a half years or so, and the Six Days War is a, is a peak, I thought, uh, that's it. We won the war. Nobody can do anything to us. We are strong. Relax. And we relaxed. And in 1973, we were found wrong. The Arabs surprised us, and they attacked us by surprise, and I learned a very important lesson. It's important to be strong. It's important not to be weak in the world of today. We saw what weakness brought us to the Jews. But you can't uh, d d be sure that you're always strong. You need to think and look again and, uh, and try to see, is there a way to solve the conflict? So I think the two wars uh, had an effect on me. But the second one, I was seven years older, which is something in, in, in these years. But understanding that wars are maybe necessary but ugly and if you can avoid them try to avoid them you know people in old days until uh, 50 years ago never saw wars when they happened the napoleon fought the russians in 1812 and if you lived in the in paris you would go to dance can can and see drink wine you didn't know what the war looks like uh, or in Russia, for that matter. Until uh, the end of the war, when Napoleon came back uh, with his uh, defeated army, they understood it didn't go well. And it would take, I think, 80 years for Tolstoy to write War and Peace. And only there you see how Andre or Natasha or, or, or uh, uh, Pierre described the war. And you see it's awful. What happened now is that there is television. There's media. And people see on the screen how war looks. They never saw it in life, in their life history, since the early days of history. Wars of Greeks and Persians and the Arabs and the English and French. Nobody knew it, how it looks. And I'm telling you, as one who was there, it's ugly. It's awful. People get killed. Yeah, they're enemies. They're soldiers. They're not bad, they're not bad guys. They, they are only soldiers. They fight you. You fight them. They try to kill me. I try to kill them. So, okay, legitimate. But then there is a wife who looks for a husband or children who look for their father, and it's destruction. War is ugly and awful. And usually it doesn't solve things. Sometimes you have to fight. Britain had to fight against the Germans. Don't say don't fight, but don't think it's fun. Don't think it's uh, like the Hollywood movies of the 50s, like you go with a, uh, on a horseback to the horizon. It's not like this. So if you can avoid war, it's important, but don't think that being weak is the answer. It's not. So the balance between the readiness for war and the reluctance to go to war is something that was shaped in me, only, not only through the war, but through the war and through my, hopefully, something in my head, thinking of what I see. So would you think, at least from your perspective, that you would say that that sort of desire to see peace was one of the driving forces for you personally of your political career? Was that one of the, the things the, that you army service? Thought, no, no, felt you were striving no, no. for? No, it was a very important uh, um, experience in my life, definitely. War is always, because it's the extreme of everything, and your life is in danger, and you can get killed or wounded, you can kill and wound others. It's, it's the worst thing, but it's very exciting in a bad sense. But they didn't shape my life. No, my life, was, I, I believe, was shaped by the way I educated, by the values I believe in, but what I see is the vision of the future and the feeling of responsibility to my society. On the, on the point of peace and, and peace building, I think it's, it's fair, only fair to bring up one of the criticism which has constantly been um, leveled at you, uh, especially in recent days. It features in the open letter, and that's a period in time in which you were serving as, as Netanyahu's deputy prime minister. Um, there was a, a bombardment of Gaza for eight days, um, which killed or reported 100 Palestinians. Um, I was wondering if you could please tell us about the decision that was taken to bombard Gaza 
whether you think there was any justification for it. Were you supportive of the government decision at the time? And do you think that calculus has changed now? Well, the facts are simply incorrect. There was a bombardment, serious one, on Israel, not on Gaza. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to go to war. What do we gain by war? We don't want to conquer Gaza. We gave Gaza to them. We said we are out of Gaza. But the Hamas, that doesn't accept the PLO, and the Iranian and other supporters launched rockets day and night. We tried to stop them from doing that. And we couldn't. So there was an operation of several days. Uh, by the way, when we started the operation, Arab countries said, kill them, finish them off. We can't continue with this Hamas. It's not only us. The world was with us, everybody. What happened, by the way, after four or five days of this war, because Israel is stronger, and the 350 square kilometers of Gaza, which is a very tiny piece of land, and you see on television, as I said earlier, how Israel, Israeli Air Force bombs this house, that house, and in no time you lose the, the public support. Because there is a reversal of, of, the, of the equation here. If you look too strong too long a time, you become the villain, although you may not be the villain. If you are too weak and suffer a long time, you become the underdog. And I remember that happening. And I always said, stop the war immediately because we are losing it on the screen. And we may be losing it. So it was a short war. Was it justified to fight? Not less than the British bombardment on Germany. Of course, you, they, be, they kill you, they bombard you. After you free them, you are not there in it anymore. What, what should you do? We didn't want to do it, by the way. I remember the, the, the government tried not. We used Egypt, uh, who was then Muslim Brotherhood, uh, tell them to stop it. We, the Americans tried to tell them. They, everybody tried that, and they, they, nobody had an influence on them. By the way, in the end, I, in the cabinet, was the war was war cabinet, the small, said, let's stop it unilaterally, although it's less good, but continuing is bad for us. They, they were hit by us, but let's stop it because it's not good. It, it looks bad. So you have to I, I, in a minute, in a minute. And, and uh, what happened is something that we didn't expect. You know, Egypt, there was a revolution. Mubarak was ousted and the Muslim Brotherhood took Egypt by Mr. Morsi. And for them, we don't exist. The Israel is not legitimate and so forth. And I was afraid that if the war goes on, we may, Egypt, we lose Egypt. They are friends of the Hamas. In fact, the Egyptian intelligence came in and they helped us have an agreement or a tacit agreement with Hamas and they stopped the war. And they went to war, an operation of several days. And uh, it's, it's something that we had to do, unfortunately. And then it was quiet for several years. You're regarded, um, Mr. Major, by, by some, and it, it's a criticism again that is levelled um, by many, including in the open letter, as taking quite a tough stance on certain social and cultural issues within Israel. But you've spoken tonight about finding common ground, about building peace. What do you see as being the, the prospect of Israel and its neighbours finding common ground, and what do you think can be done in order to help facilitate that and to facilitate peace in the Middle East? What can be done to sort of lay the groundwork for that peace over the next several years? You speak about Israel and its neighbors as if nothing happened. We have peace with our neighbors, with the exception of the Palestinians and Syria, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Syria is again, uh, Syria is now in Iran and Russia together, so it's more difficult. The, uh, we had peace, and I just described, don't want to repeat what I said, which was not an easy story. And we took risks, which I think were valid uh, risks and good risks. Uh, by the way, it was hard to, in the population, if we went for majority decision, there wouldn't be peace. Begin decided against most of his voters that he's going to give up all of the land to make peace. He convinced them in the end, otherwise there's no democracy. But he was not going to the polls like today and say, what do people want, I do it. No, he, he forced his own party and they accepted. So we had peace with Egypt and Jordan and, and you know, Saudi Arabia, not formally, but the relationship are all over the press, you see it all the time. And the Gulf States and Morocco, we have most Arab countries that are at peace with us and cooperation with us, intelligence-wise, technologically. He should have been with me in Abu Dhabi. You see, they, they, I don't want to boast, but how they treat us and we them. Palestine is a deep trouble. Can we solve it? Uh, 
I think we should try, but I say something further. No, the Palestinians are not split. The PLO is not accepted anymore by the Hamas, and Hamas doesn't say the PLO. There's not one address, not one person or one leadership that can say, this is the agreement, and we uh, pass it in our par parliament or whatever, and you pass it in yours. So uh, there's no way to get it now. They are getting worse and worse the relationship with him, and they're killing each other. They're, it's a huge fight within the Palestinian camp. And I have to say, they answered in a, in a formula is that the two sides, Israelis and Palestinians, need leadership that is ready to go against public opinion. And I say something that sounds non-democratic. Public opinion in Israel was split more or less along the years, but there was readiness of 70, 80% in all the polls to go for a two-state solution. The attempts by Barak to do it and the failure, because Arafat said no, and by Olmer to do it, and Abu Mazen didn't accept it. And by Sharon to give it and do it in retro, didn't left the peace camp in Israel without good arguments. And the Israelis did not stop believing in peace. I don't quote numbers now, but they changed. But the feeling that it's not practical, it will not happen, now seeing what happened to the Palestinians, the way they, they fight each other, uh, left and Israelis thinking, oh, we can't do anything. My position is somewhat different. I, I agree that it's quite improbable that there is a peace now possibility. Even if the Israeli government, if I were the government, and I don't agree with Netanyahu, I would go much further like others did. I, I don't think it's possible now. The Palestinians will not accept it. If you want, I, I'll explain why, but this is it. I think that what goes on now is bad because we, time worked for us, so to speak. We worked better with time along many, all those years, in terms of the economy and the army and the culture and the, the international relationship. One thing is not working for us, numbers. Israel has, as I said, 80% Jews, 20% Arabs, which is all right. You have a minority, majority, you need to keep the rights of minority, but it's basically a Jewish state and they have to accept it. Like Jews living in Britain have to accept it. On the, on the flag, there's a cross. They don't like it, but this is a state which is dominantly uh, Christian. And the same thing in Switzerland or in, uh, this is part of life. But you can live with full, full rights, even in a state that is not the nation state of your own. Uh, but in the territories, the two, two sides, Gaza and Judea and Samaria, in the West Bank, and other two in South Africa, what about them? If in the end they become part of Israel with Gaza, we come to an equality in numbers more or less. Maybe a little Jewish majority of 51%, it's not going to work, it's going to collapse. In, the other, in, in other terms, in other words, if we continue like that, we give them the ultimate weapon to say we don't want the state, we want to vote. What will we say? We are not South Africa. We are built on majority. So we need to see to it that we leave this two states option open and close the way to one state. That means don't go and settle there. Although Jews can live wherever they like, but it's not smart to go and live, to create a situation where you can't find the line in the end. So I would do certain things. I want to go into all of them to say what is the line that we want and not settle the other side, to give them all the authority on the other side. But one thing, as long as there's no agreement, I can't take the army out because it collapsed like Gaza and Hamas will take over. So I think we need to do things that may not bring peace tomorrow morning, but may facilitate and, and leave the option for peace open. Syria is a different story. It has to do other, and Lebanon is governed by Iran. So this is a story I can't solve now. One of the most famed periods of your political career was your finding of the, the Centre Party in 1999, the decision to leave the Likud, now, you mentioned earlier that that was some sort of attempt to counter Netanyahu, to counter others. Could you describe for us just briefly your role in that movement, your decisions for deciding to found the Centre Party, and, and why you ultimately ended up back with Likud? Um, well, as I explained earlier, I was born into a certain movement that was called uh, Herut Liberty and became Likud. And I was really one of the uh, people... Uh, that had been leading it in a way. And it was not easy for me to leave it. Netanyahu came in uh, in the late 80s and joined the party. He was, uh, forget the rest. And in a democratic way, he won the election. After Shamir resigned, Rabin, I mean, they, I don't want to go to all history, he won the election. And I had an option, what should I do? And I accepted the results and I worked with him. He wanted it very much and I worked with him. I was Minister of Finance under him. Uh, with him, 
uh, for a certain time. And the longer time, the differences between us grew wider and wider. Until in 97, uh, the end of 97, I couldn't take it any longer and I resigned. Did you say that must have been tough? I mean, you were with the Likud from the beginning. Yeah, I'm, yeah well, he couldn't even before Tanya was there. I'm, I'm not uh, boasting. This is a fact, that's all. And I uh, resigned. And then uh, I asked myself, what should I do now? And there were a couple of, few of us of the Likud leadership and few of the other side, labor people and the uh, two generals, very popular generals from the army who resigned from the army. And we decided then to build a new party, we call it the Center Party. And uh, we ran for this election, we got uh, into the Knesset, but <clears throat> and we helped bring Netanyahu down and Barak, head of labor then, became the prime minister with our support. But the party uh, did not uh, have a good glue in a way. The relationship personally was very good, but it, uh, within a year or two years, we decided it doesn't have a future. And uh, not in a very uh, easy way, we, we came, went back, some of us left at all, and I came back to the Likud. And I was there uh, in the Likud, not very active. Uh, I, and then uh, after six or seven years, even outside the Knesset, I became a lawyer again. I had a good life in many ways. Tanel approached me and asked me to come back. It was 2008. For a whole year, we were meeting once a month, I think. I, I then, for the government that was not Tanel's government still, or even under him, we, uh, I, I was asked to write Israel defense uh, doctrine. I was dealing a lot with defense, and I did that. So he Steve consulted me about defense issues, sensitive issues, which I did. And then he asked me to join. And I, uh, after deliberation with myself, uh, decided to join back. And I joined in 2009 and served the government for four years until 2013. And then it was the end of my uh, political career. Uh, so th this government was uh, not a bad government. I think they made some mistakes. But basically, it was a good government, I think. And in 2013, I wasn't any more member of it. And I'm conscious of the... And I have to say, I didn't ask. I left the Likud some years ago because the Likud changed the nature of the, of the, of the party. The Likud's name, the formal name given to it by Begin was Likud, which means unity in Hebrew, a national liberal movement. The, the merger or the balance between these two values that are different, the national value and the liberal value. To me, this is the genetic code that was so important. Without the national cause, we tried it. Jews all over the world, we saw where it led. Being only liberal, democratic, there are no nations, there are no culture, is wrong. But if you go too much to the national side, you end up in ex extreme that you don't want to be in. And to be totally cosmopolitan, again, is, is dangerous. So we were able to hold this together. The Likud of today is not there. They left the liberal uh, part of it uh, entirely. And they are more like, what you see the right wing in many countries in the world today, I can't belong there and I quit the party. I'm conscious of the time, um, Mr. Merger, and, and the need to move on to audience questions, of which we have a few. If I may, just one last question for me on your post-political career. Um, since leaving politics, you've been involved in an organization called the Jerusalem Foundation. I wonder if you might talk a bit about the work that you've been doing with them. There is a foundation that was established by a man called Teddy Kolik, who was the mayor of Jerusalem for 28 years, legendary person, the left-wing uh, Labour Party, but he was the mayor of Jerusalem. And he, he established a, an association, not in the municipality, that would be able to help Jerusalem outside the municipality uh, budgets and constraints and so forth. And uh, in a certain time, after he resigned, or he already died, I think, they asked me to head this organization, which I did very well, uh, with very enthusiasm. Uh, all this is not for money, it's pro bono, of course, but I, we uh, gathered, we, we uh, looked for resources to help Jerusalem uh, in, in the world, mainly in the Jewish world, and a uh, lot of association, education association, universities, uh, theater, were financed by this organization, and I was there 60 years, and then I left, and other people are doing it. Picking up on that, a, a criticism which has often been leveled at the organization is that it funded Arab communities to a lesser extent than Jewish ones. How would you respond what? to that criticism? 
to, to uh, that it funded Arab neighbourhoods to a lesser extent than, than Jewish ones. Well, it's again it's saying something that is entirely wrong. It's, it's accused by many Israelis, Jews, that we give too much to the Arabs. I don't think we give too much because they are the underprivileged and we should give them more because of, they, should, they should be uh, uh, help to them. The Jews, the Jews Foundation gave to Jerusalemites, not to people, to organizations. I, for one, I remember going to Switzerland, getting from the Swiss government 17, 000, 17 million, was it francs or dollars, I don't remember, for a bilingual school of Jews and Arabs together, which is not usually the case. These are people, and the bilingual school is there in Jerusalem, and we did it for them. And there are other things we did there. I don't want to go into detail. It's simply wrong. When people level accusations, like this letter, all wrong, or 90% wrong, and then you need to defend. I want to defend myself. It's simply wrong. I don't want to go into details. And the Jerusalem Foundation is exactly this, which is why it's not very much liked by the right-wingers. But uh, this is the fact. I don't think there's any... I didn't hear to this minute. The Jerusalem Foundation is, is, was... I'm not there anymore, but it, it is... Uh, it, uh, uh, discriminate against Arabs, just the opposite. I can see that our audience has, has many more questions. Yes, so we'll, we'll move on to those. Um, just in the front row. Glad to know that lawyers can lead a good life as someone who eventually wants to become one. Um, my question is really about, um, so, you know, I'm really concerned that um, when Jews deviate from what is expected of them, society clamps down on them. So I'm thinking about, you mentioned America being a safe haven, and in many ways it was when United Kingdom, Canada, else, elsewhere weren't. Um, but then, you know, Ethel Rosenberg was an innocent woman who was, um, you know... Ethel Rosenberg? Yeah, she was... Um, Julius Ethel Rosenberg, the trial... Accused, yeah, the, right, yeah. exactly, the first woman to have, so, have been convicted and sentenced to death. In addition, Noam Chomsky, you know, for defending Holocaust denialism. In addition, Tali Fahima for calling herself Palestinian. So Jews that deviate from what is expected of Jews tend to bear the wrath of society. And I think until that changes... Um, until that changes, where is the hope? Again, I, what is the, the question? The, answer? the question the, is... What is what about Jews? What about Jews? The, the question the, is... The role of Jews in society or what? No, no, no. The question is that the Zionist project is meant to protect us, right? The, um, the Zionists, yeah, okay. But are we really protected unless and until no, let that me, changes? I, let me, if I, I'm not sure, not sure I understood your question, but let me say what I understood from you. That's all Jews, you can do. Jews, all right. Jews, Jews as uh, you know, after uh, in the first century AD and uh, second century, Jews uh, were under Roman rule, the Roman Empire, and the, uh, there was a rebellion against the Romans, and the Romans uh, won, definitely, a strong empire destroyed the temple, which was the center of Jewish uh, religion and statehood, and Jews were exiled. Jews were dispersed all over the world, added to the Jews who were dispersed the 8th century BC by the Babylonians to, to Babylon, Iraq of today. So Jews became a people without a land. And what kept them together is religion. The same religion, with very few differences, would be uh, practice in Iraq and in Moscow and Berlin and, and even London. Uh, Jews were never, for many years, were not equal citizens. In this country, in I think uh, 20, 1296, expelled all the Jews. And uh, I don't want to go into history. All over the place, Jews were either uh, taken politely into society or discriminate against and persecution, okay. But Jews live like this, believing that we need to wait for Messiah to come. The Christian will say to come again, for us to come, but when he comes, he'll ask him whether it's first time or second time. But in the meantime, don't do a thing. You're in exile and stay in exile. You sinned against God. You didn't keep the commandments. And the rabbis and the religious establishment said we are there. In the 18th, 19th century, with the Enlightenment, with the new secularism all over the world, there was a dramatic change. And uh, there was a phenomenon people didn't know in the past, a secular Jew. So my Jewish, if it's religion, how can you be secular Jew? No, the Jews are a nation, a people. 
defined by religion in diaspora because that's, they had no common geography, common anything else. But we want to return to the to history and become what and become again what we were a nation with the sovereignty with land and so forth, and there was a development in the 19, late 19th century early 20th century, and the return to the, uh, the ancient homeland was accepted by the way, of the world of then the world of today may be different, by the British government and they gave the declaration in 1917 the Jews would be helped to return to their homeland. Uh, and the League of Nations, uh, they give the mandate to Britain to help build the Jewish national homeland. This is the word there. And there was a religious uh, color to it. Uh, uh, the, the, religion, the Prime Minister of Britain that had this religion. Here, the Bible said the Jews will come back, we'll help them to come back. And, and so this was the beginning of the Zionist movement. The Jews are a nation. It's a huge revolution. From re some religious guys, they don't accept it. How can you be Jewish if you're not keeping all the commandments, if you're not eating kosher, whatever? But the world today is a different world. So this to, now to be a nation means that you need to do things you never did in diaspora, to have policemen, to legislate, to deal with minorities. Now you are a majority. How do you treat minorities? Not when you were minorities, it's very easy to be for minorities. Now you are a majority. How do you treat minorities amongst you? All sorts of tests that are being uh, experienced, experimented, if you like, in, in, in Israel. So now you have Jews in Israel, about 7 million and something, more than 7 million in Israel, and about the same number in the diaspora all over the world. It's a major shift in Jewish history, of course, after European Jewry was massacred. You have to remember that. And the relationship between Jews here and there are, are, are important. And this, some of them see in Israel as a safe haven if something happens. Where I live in Jerusalem, I hear now more American, English, and French of Jews buying apartments just in case of coming to, or, or coming to Israel. So the, the relationship between the Jews and the Jewish values and Israel is interesting because Jewish values, as we know them, were developed in diaspora, not when you are the government. Now you are the government. How do you develop Jewish? What is to be Jewish today in terms of values? So we are experimenting that. And by the way, the election I mentioned is, in a way, all about that. What sort of country are we going to be? So this is more or less what I can tell you, but how, how, it's very important to me, uh, the Jewish part of me, and I'm not religious, uh, but I'm fully Jewish and fully human, fully all sorts of other things, but being a member of the Jewish people is important to me, and I care about the Jewish people. Yeah. You, you've spoken a bit about the need to accept that Israel is a Jewish state. Do you think that Israel has come far enough in, in terms of minority protection? What, what still needs to be done? I think inside Israel, I don't speak of the territories, to make very clear there, there's, it's not part of Israel, it's not democracy, it's something that needs to be changed. It's an anomaly that we tried to change, we couldn't or we should, I don't leave that. Leave that. Yes, Israel is a, a democracy with minority rights. Could it be better? Yes, it can be better. But it's much better than minority rights in most other countries. It's, uh, I think we should always do better, not because we don't like it, but because I think it's our interest. And there is, as I said, the moral test. We were minorities all over the world, which is why Jews were quite at the front of the fights for human rights and minority rights in America and South Africa were not. And Jews were the, among the drafters of the Human Rights Convention in, in, in Europe. So the test is not when you are a minority. The test of, of yourself is when you are a majority. And can, can you, do you give the minority the same, the same rights you want to be given when you're a minority. This is, I think, the moral test for us. And I, I think basically, yes, we do it right. Now there's other trends I spoke of earlier of the, against the stranger. The other, you see it all over the world, including in Israel, and I don't like it. And there is a fight over the values. But basically, the Arabs, now in the Knesset today, there are Arab members who have voted, like, who vote like me and have, have been voted in like me and it's full equality in, in these terms. Is there a gap? Yes, there are gaps. The, the Arab Christian society is very high in terms of income and education. The Muslim Arab society is much lower. It's not Jews and Arabs. It's, it's other things that has to do with this. We need to do more to give affirmative actions, you say, to the poor guy. The ultra-Orthodox Jews and the, and the Muslim Arabs are the poorer. So yes, you need to have them. But yes, it's a, it's a minority that enjoys civil rights. Could be better, yes, should be better. Not by law. The law is all right. But practice. Um, there's a hand there that's in the secondary that's been up for a while. 
So upon hearing of your invite, thousands of academics, students, and staff, including 32 organizations within Cambridge University, signed an open letter condemning your disgraceful invite to the union, leading to the union not even promoting your talk as they would with other maybe, events. You know, maybe they're it's a very poor the turnout. As I'm sure you can hear, there are hundreds of students just outside protesting your presence at this union. I'd like to reiterate it to your face. You're, you and any other war criminal will never, ever be welcome at this university. Thank you. Okay. We, I'm, which, I'm glad you are out of the hole. I don't want to uh, welcome you. You don't want to welcome me. It's fine. Um, I think it is very important that we get some member engagement here. Yeah. Um, it's again also um, just the hand in the third row there. Um, yeah. Hey, um, do you have anything to say to the protesters outside who claim that you have violated the human rights of Palestinians? I think, could you repeat it? Um, do you, uh, he says, do you have anything to say to the protesters outside who claim that you violated the rights of Palestinians? Yeah, I think, I think that... Uh, I said it, I don't want to repeat what I said. I think we have an unresolved issue. It needs to be resolved. If you go, want to go deeper, I'll tell you what I think was holding the, the uh, conflict from being resolved. Until recently. Recently, there's a collapse of the, of the Palestinian leadership, so it's another problem. The PLO, you may not know, I don't want to ask you, when was it established? When? Not after we got the territories. After Israel was established. So to liberate the Middle East from Israel, not from territories. I repeat it. The idea that Israel is a wrong creature it's illegal, it's immoral, and so forth, was the basis, the foundation of the PLO. It was established in 1964 or 5, 4 and 5, before the Six Days War, before there were territories, as they call them. There was Israel, and they didn't want to accept Israel. When it came at Kim David to the point that almost everything was agreed, and I'm telling you from personal experience, I was there, it's known, it's not a secret thing, it was published all over the world. There was a question of the borders. It was more or less agreed. Not in the exact line, but this was not the problem. That the large part, almost all the land will go to them. A small part will stay with us for the 80% the settlers. It is almost nothing. The issue of security was agreed. Clinton, the last night, agreed on, made us agree on the other things. Jerusalem, which is a topic of great importance, Although it has never been an Arab capital, the Arabs never made it a capital. It was our capital, but they wanted it for their capital. And Ehud Barak, the prime minister, agreed to something I would not have agreed, but he agreed, maybe rightly, maybe he was right. He agreed to divide Jerusalem, the Arab parts to the Arab, the Jewish parts to, the, to, to Israel. And uh, there was an issue, religious issue of Temple Mount. And there were all sorts of compromises, leave it uh, unresolved, all sorts of ideas. If I might the one thing that was not resolved, which is the crux of the matter here, Arafat was, the, was asked to say, if we have a state, that's the end of the conflict. No more claims. In other words, when you have a state, you won't continue to demand to, to go to Israel millions and, and, and turn Israel to another Arab state. What they call the right of return, or the claim to return. And this broke the whole story. It, just to another element here, 2008, there was a negotiation between Olmert and Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the heir to Arafat. And don't take my words or Olmert's words. There's a book by Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State, of 500 pages. I read the 60 pages relevant. And she says, Olmert comes to her and says, or calls her, come, we can solve the problem. I think we have a solution. There are 260 meetings, Israeli Palestinian, on the details. And he comes, she comes and he talks to her over dinner at his home. And uh, she, he says to him, I give the Palestinians, I, I don't quote verbatim, all the land with 6% of swap, it's the same country anyway, so they'll get 6 and we'll more or less. Uh, Palestinian statehood, of course, end of occupation. Jerusalem, Arab to the Arabs, Jewish to Israel. And he even offered something that I wouldn't have because I think it's not practical. International regime in the holy basin, the old city and around it. When you, when you but say, one thing, not he said, I'm not ready after the state that they have what they call return to Israel. I can give them 5,000 people to come. She goes, she thought, she said, I didn't believe my ears, she's right. She goes to Ramallah after talking to Bush, the president. And she talks to Abu Mazen, who was a nice guy. I met him, he was at my home. 
And he says to her the following, here I quote, I think, verbatim, how can I tell four million Palestinians only 5,000 go home? In other words, without the right of return, there's no end with the Palestinian state. They want to continue the struggle until there's no Israel. If there is no Palestinian leader, and I hope there will be one, I think in the young generation there might be some, who understand that we need to divide painfully a land that I'm sure is all mine and he's sure is all his. The way is to divide it between two sides and everybody will exhaust his demands in their part, there won't be agreement. If you have a Palestinian leader like that, hopefully there will be one, and an Israeli leader that then reciprocate, then there will be peace. If we, if we don't do that, it's going to be much more difficult. Can I just focus in on what you mean by reciprocate? I mean, if you wouldn't agree to those compromises, what path do you see forwards? How do you think the two sides should, should come together? Now they see. I, I, I don't mean it will drill, take a long time. In Gaza, for example, there is no way to have an agreement because they say Israel does not exist. We're not talking with Israel. We, Israel is not legitimate and religiously, it's something that won't work. But in spite of that, we were able. The, the government, I, not me, I was had nothing to do with, to use uh, another mechanism. Of course, when they fight, we have to fight back, and it's tough and so forth. But there is the the sticks, but there are the carrots. And in, for Gaza, we are uh, an economic power. Not for the world, but for Gaza, we are economic power. And the fact that they gave them a, a lot of economic freedom to do what they like and improve their economic life, in return, not for agreement of peace, they will never do that, but for what they call hudna, that they won't, that will be quiet on the border, they won't be shooting. And it worked quite well. There is, with Gaza, you see, if they are launching rockets, it's from the Islamic Jihad, a smaller group that, uh, that Iran leads, but Hamas is working tacitly under the table with us to keep it quiet. It's not peace yet, but it's better than fighting. In the West Bank or, or Judea and Samaria, I think, as I said earlier, that we need to set a line and say we don't want to settle on the other side of that line. And this line will give them more than 90% of the land. And we give you all the authority. You won't have Israeli police. It's your police. You have to do it. Zoning, planning, all yours. We will take the army out once you say that you have a peace agreement with us. We can't do it other than that. I think this is a movement forward. Will it bring a full peace? When? I don't know. But this is something I think we need to do for our interests and for their interests. We've run over time, but we've plenty of audience questions, so I want to take as many as I can. Um, uh, just going over to this side, um, just at the back there. So you talked about uh, international relations and also to Iran, and I wanted, um, what is your stance on the current situation in Iran? So do you think that protests might uh, issue a bit of hope um, that the situation will get better in the future, or do you think that anti-Semitism is just rooted too deeply into Iranian society that um, there is any hope? You see, you mean on the Iran issue or the Palestinian issue? In Iran. In Iran. Iran is a tough issue. Iran is a serious nation. So here it's for me. It's 4,000 years of culture of the Persian people. They're not only Persian, but the Persians are the leading element in society. It was uh, a secular Muslim country, which is not a simple thing. Two were Turkey and Iran, which is why Turkey and Iran are strong countries in the Middle East. Interestingly, one professor once wrote there are three strong countries in the Middle East which is predominantly Arab, the Middle East. It's Turkey, Iran, and Israel, none of them is Arab. Not because we are any better genetically, but because secularism came in. And religion, like in Europe, in the fight between the church and Galileo, Copernicus, science was a lot developed, and the church had, or, or the, the religion did not uh, coerce it. And uh, in the Arab countries, it uh, went differently, so... They were the height of science in the Middle Ages, algebra, mathematica, philosophy, declined. Iran and Turkey are, uh, are exception to the rule. Iran was a very advanced country. Yes, under the Shah, it's not a democratic regime. I'm not, uh, I, can't, I can't hide this, but until 1979, until the revolution, Iran was a friend of Israel, by the way. We were on good, very good terms. Uh, and uh, to this day, if you go to international competitions of mathematics, computers, you see Iranians up at the, at the top. Or you know, the top, very high up, up anyway. So Iran is not a simple story. They have this regime 
that is that is uh, awful regime to me, uh, coercing the, the, the uh, awful norms like about women. You see now the the courageous women, and uh, I don't know if you saw CNN last night the report on how how they crushed the. The, the demonstration, including sexual violence, awful things that I didn't believe my ears hearing. And uh, we want to believe that we live in a world where justice prevails. Well, not, all, not always. And if they are strong enough, I don't know what will happen. If somebody would have said to me or to people before me in 1917, after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, that it cannot uh, survive because it's against human nature, he would be right. Only it took about 70 years. So I don't know whether these this people, this regime, will be able to continue and crush the objection. They have, they have they are religiously based, and religion is very important there. And it's bad now. Uh, it, it causes, it poses a threat, as I said earlier, to most Arab countries, and you hear it from them. Uh, and I think that uh, the if international relationship, international uh, policy is uh, guided in a way that there is a grand coalition, as it was in 2015 against Iran. America, even Russia was part of that then, I have to say, and, and uh, Europe, of course, and Canada, Australia, most of, and most Arab countries. Then the pressure on Iran, hopefully not through war, but sanctions and so forth, may, may bring down the regime, but I'm not sure it's going to happen, or may force them to change their course, or to, not to do certain things. This is the preferred way. To do it alone, as some Israelis want, is very courageous but stupid. If you can act in such a grand coalition, use the potential of such grand coalition. And it's not a, a simple, small country that you can uh, do away with. No. They are, we have been trying to stop them from getting nuclear. I don't want to go into detail. There were all sorts of stories that I can, I can but I'm not allowed to speak of. But they did not stop. We delay them. They are stubborn. They are. They want to continue, and they are. They have leadership for that. So it's it's a real contest between two powers: the more conservative, more traditional power in the Arab world. No democracies there. Not playing games. There no democracy in the Arab world in, in the terms we know. But they're more stable and less less uh, destabilizing. And Iran is on different course. Again, the leadership of the world is near there. Israel has its role, but it's not the, to me, it's not the main story of Israel. It's the Arab countries and, and the world, the, the America, Britain, and, and France, and the, the world that can do something. It's important because, think of it, if they have a nuclear bomb, in no time Saudi Arabia will have a nuclear bomb. They will not let Iran do it without them. And they can do it. I mean, money is not in shortage there, and the science is there. And then Egypt, Ubuntu, you have a nuclear race in a very unstable area, it's dangerous. So it needs to be stopped. Forget Israel for a minute. It needs to be stopped. I, it, can it be done? I think, I hope it can be done. I can't give any guarantee. Um, yes, just in the third row. Okay. Hi. Does this work? Um, I posed a variation of this question to Zippy Hatolvi when she came to the union and gave no response. So I'm hoping you can give a response. Um, you claimed that the open letter signed uh, was full of lies and was made out of ignorance. Um, human rights groups, such as groups in Israel like Beit Salem, have said that the country has worked contrary to human rights and has made human rights violations. Do you think such groups, similar to the open letter, are full of lies and ignorance, or is there some truth to the claims made by Beit Salem? Not sure I heard all the questions. Maybe my hearing is problematic or the acoustics here. You don't have a problem like this. If you speak of human rights and the Palestinian issue, there is a problem of human rights. There is a problem because if people don't live in democracy, there's basically a human rights problem. Britain should know it in running the entire world under its colonies, under human rights. It's bad. It needs to be resolved. I don't want to, to continue. But it can be resolved in a way that will eliminate us. I think it needs to be resolved. And in the meantime, when it's not yet resolved, we need to take care of human rights. For example, Again, I don't want to speak of myself. You asked too many questions of myself, but we did something that no other country did. The, our courts, including the High Court of Justice, is open to Palestinians. In Britain, it was not the case, by the way. In America, it's not the case to Guantanamo and other places. So they come and they, they go to the, to the High Court of Justice, and not every time, but many times, they, were, they get the, 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 the injunction or whatever they want. We try. We, I mean, I, I definitely try to do that, and I was, people 
even didn't like what I did, but Israel, as a rule, did try to maintain the highest possible way of human rights. But I agree, when you live under uh, in a regime where you are not electing or selecting the military in the neighborhood, it's, it's not human rights. Even then, one should see to it that they have the best you can, and the, the right thing to do is to resolve it and to come to an agreement where there is a Palestinian state alongside Israel, that's the end of the conflict, not continuing saying, now we want to go to your country, and they will go in millions, because it's, uh, I think, six or seven times higher standard of living, and it's a kilometer away. So, would so you there won't be an agreement, there won't be a solution. So it's a tough, tough decision. For myself, who was born in a family that believed in the entirety of the land of Israel, and all these hours, to accept that we have to divide it, I'm telling you, it's so painful. And I'm one of many, I'm not... I want to accept that on the other side there are people who feel the same. But without this uh, solution, what do you want to do? I so think this is the only way to get out of it. Would you say that in your view that Palestinians have insufficient access to the sort of mechanisms of justice within? Yeah, they have access. They have access whether the courts always give them what they want, not, not to them, not to me. The courts do what they like, but basically the courts have been known in the world. I can give you a lot of citation in the world for the Israeli courts to keep a standard of, stand of human rights and democracy as much as you can under a, a, a situation of, of, of uh, the West Bank and Gaza is now not there. It's uh, like a foreign land. We're not there. We're not controlling. But the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, you have uh, two and a something million Palestinians. Not, I don't think there's a week passing or two weeks that they don't appeal to the courts. And the courts sometimes give them, sometimes don't. Sometimes the court do what I think is right. Sometimes the courts do what I think is wrong. But there is an excess. Nobody demands. No other country in the world did it. But we do it, I think, rightly. And especially now that it's 50 years and more, people cannot be left without a remedy somehow. And the remedy is something sometimes given by the court. Sometimes the court say, we can't do that. It's over my, our jurisdiction. Do you think as a, as a former minister of justice, you were in a position to sort of shape that in a positive direction? Is there, is there anything you would do now if you could be minister of justice again to further improve the situation? <laughs> I want now the situation not to deteriorate. I don't know what will happen. I, uh, you know, society has changed. You could have thought that after, uh, if you know law, after Roe versus Wade 50 years ago, uh, a woman has the right to have abortion. The court changed in America, and they have no rights like this. So I, I can, things change. If the society will go this American way, I hope that America will go back. We'll have troubles. I hope not. I can say, I, I, no, I remember the... A British case, the war on Iraq, 91. The case called, I think, Shablak against something, the Secretary of Home Secretary. One day, one night, the court case by uh, Master, Master of the Rules, I forgot who he was, Donaldson, I think. The, the people from the Home Office knocked at the door and said, Mr. Shablak, saying to him, we deport you. Say, hey, I'm, I'm living here for several years. I'm almost naturalized, and I want to go to, uh, to stay. And his family here he said, no, we have information, intelligence, that you uh, support Saddam Hussein, and you are trying to do something. And he goes to the courts. And the, there is a, a case that I learned there when it happened. They say it's a, it's a national security issue. It's non-justiciable. And he's not given it, and he's, he's, he's ex deported. So uh, I think it was the wrong decision. All the Israeli decisions are what I like. No, not always in every court. But there is a way that they have an access to the court of Israel. Yeah. Um, now I want to get in. Um, I know that we've, we've run way over. I need to get in um, just one more audience question just before we wrap up. I'd like to get in um, some more participation. Yes, you've had your hand up for a while. So go to you. Uh, just in the middle of that row. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, I'm just wondering what you think the um, role of the Western media has been playing on increased anti-Semitism again, again. in the UK, in particular in London. That's the role of the Western media, yeah. anti-Semitism in the UK in particular, in London. There's been a lot of... Well, see, I, I, uh, I'm a visitor. I should, should be polite being a visitor. And I, uh, I think that... Uh, when I spoke earlier of a change in the world, back to identity, who I am, who I am not. Usually I define myself not as how good I am, but who I am not. 
I'm not the Mexican in America, I'm not the, uh, the foreign worker, I'm not the black, I'm not the white, I'm not the Muslim, I'm not the Jew. So in this uh, atmosphere, anti-Semitism, by the way, and anti-Islam as well, grows. And you feel, and it's not easy because people feel somewhat threatened and they want to go back to their own to feel, it becomes like a, a football fans. I'm for Manchester United or Manchester City better today, and I don't care who makes the foul. It's not a foul. It's my, it's my, it's my company. People vote because they belong to a certain group, and sometimes it's defined against whom they are. So there's a lot of anti rather than pro, and this is a good uh, soil on which anti-Semitism can can uh, be planted, and and uh, and uh, you see it in France, you see it, you see it in America. Uh, Again, being a Zionist, I say to Jews, you have a problem, you have a homeland, come here, there won't be anti-Semitism, come there, to Israel. But it's not, a, it's not a good answer. People have a right to live wherever they want without being attacked for their uh, identity, religion, tradition, uh, ethnic, ethnicity. And it's, by the way, it's a problem for the Jews, it's a problem for the countries that don't deal with it. It begins against the Jews, it ends up in a bad society in many ways. So yes, there is more anti-Semitism in the world now. It comes from traditional anti-Semitism. In some countries, the church was very instrumental, not in all of them, the Catholic church more than others. Uh, even, by the, even Luther had awful, awful preaching against the Jews. Uh, the church is now less influential in, in Western Europe. And there is a racist anti-Semitism sometimes, and there is uh, on many Muslims who came to Britain, because they're anti-Israeli, maybe there's a combination, so many sources. How bad it is, you should know better than I. I'm not, I don't want to give you any uh, expertise because I don't know. I read the press, I hear from people. I hear, as I told you, I see in Israel, uh, many, I don't have numbers here, people coming from those well-established countries, not from the Soviet Union when it collapsed. And uh, how many there are, I don't know. But I, see, I hear the English, more, more of them speak American English, not British English, I have to say, and French in, in, in my neighborhood, in Jerusalem and other places. So they have where to go. This is something that I uh, always say. I could just tell you the following: When there was, we opened the open the, the gates of the Soviet Union were open in the late 80s, early 90s. To me, it was like a dream come true. I never, I wanted always the people there to be able to come to us, but they were closed. They couldn't. But they came in huge numbers, about a million people within uh, less than 10 years. It was a 20% addition to society, un unbelievable numbers. I was then Minister of Justice, but I, I dealt with it a lot. And I used to go to the airport at night just to see it. You see planes coming from Odessa, from Moscow, from St. Petersburg, from all over the Soviet Union, and unloading, so to speak, thousands and thousands of people from all sorts of faces and nights. And I thought, you know, people feel there that they, something is going bad going to happen. They have where to go. And 50 years earlier, they had nowhere to go. Mr. Meridor, thank you so much for coming. And thank you um, to everyone uh, in the audience for coming here and engaging um, with thank our speaker you. here this evening. It's really what this place is all about, is providing you with an opportunity to engage in a dialogue with our speakers and to challenge them. So thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Thank you.